I've seen them done in all kinds of ways, up to including I've had them use um, the uh, uh, the circle the circle um, uh, irrigation systems. Um, where I subdivided into a pie shape and the water is in the center and everybody has access to it, um, but closed off from other sections of the, of, the, of the growth area. So yeah, I mean, there's just all kinds of creative ways you can do this and you just have to trial and error it a little bit. Hey, hey, it's Shay, and you're listening to Casual Cattle Conversations, the podcast for cattle producers to explore new ideas that will help improve their overall management practices. Speaking of improving management, I want to encourage you to take a look at the lineup for the quarter two Rancher Mind events. These laid back Q&A calls are between industry experts and fellow beef producers, and quarter two is all about labor challenges. I mean, we're talking how, when, and where to find the right help, when to integrate new technology onto your operation, and how to become a more efficient manager and leader overall. If you want more information on being a part of these producer-driven conversations, head to the show notes and click the link that'll take you straight to my website. With that, let's hear what our guest has to share with us today. Well, good afternoon, Ray. Once again, great as always to have you on the show. I always tell you and Wes that I need to get you like co-host caps or something (laughs) because you've been a great part of the show in the past six months. I know today we're really going to talk about grazing and kind of specifically kind of dive into some of the rotational grazing aspect and really just kind of give an overview so that cattle producers understand, you know, what do they need to keep in mind as Maybe they're doing it again or they're starting it for the first time. So that way they're a little more prepared. And if anything else, it allows all of us up north to think about spring because I think we'd really appreciate that. So thanks for being on the show today. Well, thanks for having me, Shay. I'm really excited to be here. And gosh, you know, like you said, it's uh, it's getting close. Uh, uh, We had a few good warm days the other day, and I'm thinking about being in the pasture and you know, things are going to start to grow here pretty quick. And so it's always an exciting time for us in the, in the spring. And we get super busy with all kinds of different things from electric fencing to watering. And uh, the big topic, of course, is the rotational grazing and getting ready for that. And, mm. um, uh, you know, we talk to a lot of folks and uh, gosh, how do I get started? How do I how do I do this? And um, we just, you know, break it down in simple ways and just say, you know, planning is everything. And when you've got a good set of uh, uh, paddocks or pastures that you're going to subdivide up and move your cattle across, um, you know, I, I tell people just to start from the perimeter out. I mean, make sure you've got a great outside perimeter fence that we can attach, um, you know, subdividing electric fence if you wanted to going across the pasture and just kind of keep an eye on on your uh, on your uh, their plant growth and making sure that your animals are getting moved in a in a steady way and that there's just, you know, there's good fresh water available and planning for that. And, um, but for the folks that are starting out, you know, or or just, you know, getting, getting a a plan put together, um, we've got a few tips that we could share with you and about uh, how to get going. Yeah. So let's kind of talk about that a little more. So, and I, I'm asking this because I would like for my family to do a little bit more rotational grazing. We do some, but not as heavy as maybe I would like. Um, Mm -hmm. But so you talked about, you know, start with the perimeter and work and make sure you have that good perimeter fence. What are the other components? If you can kind of list them off for rotational grazing that producers need to keep in mind. Well, with cattle, especially, um, it it doesn't take a whole lot to keep them into a a space um, or a line or an area. Um, one of the main things that we, we try to key in on, and I know that, uh, you've had others on the, on the program that have talked about a good source of fresh water. Um, that's key to it and making sure that you've got that infrastructure put in place. Now that can be done in a couple different ways. Uh, you can create a, like, a, an alley up the center of a pasture that, uh, you can move cattle from one to the next, or you could literally just subdivide them off when, and keep them in a, in a, a narrow strip. And uh, with that said, um, a lot of folks will take uh, water lines down the perimeter fence and then feed into, let's say, um, a a portable waterer or some kind of a watering system that's uh, available to the animals uh, that they can get to while they're on uh, on pasture. But um, moreover, looking at um, how many animals are you going to graze, 
um, what's the history of this past year and what do you have planted? Uh, making sure that you're just super conscious about going out and checking um, the, the, the way it's been eaten down. Um, we don't want to get too far down. Obviously, we want to we want to move them at the appropriate time. You don't want to move them too fast or um, too late, uh, if you will, because it'll just damage the field and damage the plant growth, and you won't have the recovery that you would typically have if you if you move them more often. So, but yeah, just looking at just the simple tools, um, a reel, uh, some some electric fence posts, and um, you know, going across a, a line, um, getting them in that in a single line will keep cattle in. Um, making sure that your that your energizer that you use for this subdividing is um, a solar unit, so you don't have to worry about power. Um, you can energize obviously uh, a cross fence with uh, a perimeter electric fence if you wanted to. So as simple or as complicated as you want to make it, um, obviously most folks want to keep it as simple as possible. So moving animals across the field um, shouldn't take a long period of time. And uh, some of the tools that are available, as an example, um, like I said, you can use um, of, uh, just a ring top post to go across the field. You can use a tumble wheel, um, which I'll in the in the remarks and at the lower part, I will have a, a link to um, a, a, a piece called a tumble wheel, and that allows one yeah. person. Go, the go ahead. tumble wheel. So actually, um, gosh, Neil yeah. just shared that as well. He talked about the tumble wheel and your smart fence. Right. Well, and it's it's just these these were designed to to move things fast. I mean, and not put a lot of labor into moving animals across the field. And um, and as he may have mentioned about the tumble wheel, man, you can put these fifty feet apart uh, these these uh, spokes, and as they chink across, you can just pull the line and the hair. You know, you literally can move um, you know hundreds of feet in just a few minutes. So um, I think it's about it, it can't be a daunting task. It has to be a, a piece where you know. Uh, I can do it by myself. I don't have to have a lot of help with it. And um, just just being observant, basically. And after a good rain and, you know, some moisture, um, things are going to come back pretty fast. Um, as I move animals and the plant growth um, is cut down by the uh, by the animals eating and trampled down, um, it'll recover quicker if you uh, if you move them a little more often. So um, we just want to carefully manage this process. And um, gosh, it can lead to healthy animals. Um, very economical uh, when when you're considering the feed that, 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 and the fattening up of these animals, because the the top part of the plant is the most nutritious part of the of the of the plant. And when you get down below, you, you get into warmer issues and things like that. So you don't want to get them down too far. So just being cognizant of that and understanding plant growth in total. So you know you mentioned earlier in that statement, you know when you're talking about water, how some people potentially fence off lanes, um, or there are different options for water there. But when we're looking at like paddock or pasture design, yeah, is that, you know, I believe it was Jeremy from your team at one point talked about all you need is a graph paper and a pencil and go to your NRCS office and get those aerial footage or get a yep. drone out there, whatever it takes. Is that what you recommend? Or do you Absolutely. have other tips for that? Like what, you know, what do producers need to consider as they, you know, is it how, how do they make these designs? How do they know how big to make them? Like, what do they need to be figuring through the going through in their mind and writing down to figure out what's going to work for them and their schedule? Well, and to your point about NRCS, they have a great resource um, of how to design a paddock and how, how many animals should be put on, um, you know, uh, acreage and such. But, you know, the, the aerial photograph of, of your place is so dynamic and so easy to, to kind of understand the sections of, of your property. And um, obviously, smaller groups of animals uh, don't require a whole lot. I mean, you can rotate them faster and, and across, you know, smaller strips. Larger groups are going to have a little bit more consideration to have. Um, but to your point about the graph paper, I literally set one of these up just the other day with a customer and um, it was so easy because we just looked down and we we just kind of developed a plan based on the, the aerial photograph mm -hmm. and to what Jeremy said and the laying down the center so we can get animals back to uh, the barn um, or back to a watering area um, that they are pie shaped. I've seen them done in all kinds of ways up to including I've had them use um, the uh, uh, the circle, the circle um, uh, irrigation systems. 
um, where I subdivide it into a pie shape and the water is in the center and everybody has access to it, um, but closed off from other sections of the of the of the growth area. So, yeah, I mean, there's just all kinds of creative ways you can do this. And you just have to trial and error it a little bit and just kind of look at, um, you know, can, like I mentioned earlier on weather and the number of animals is all going to be uh, a factor in how fast the, the, the spring growth is occurring. And to keep this going all through the summer, um, gosh, uh, the hotter it gets, the more necessity to have fresh water available. Um, so digestion occurs naturally and normally, and everything is, is good. Um, the health of the animal um, is, is completely maintained. So yeah, so design with purpose, design with water in mind, and think about plant growth and developing a good movement program that can be trial and error a little bit at the beginning. But once you get an idea of what your animals are going to do, just go for it and move them across. Now, you say you're working with producers to kind of help them design what's going to mm -hmm. work for them, help them make sure they have the right tools and technology. Are you predominantly working with commercial cattlemen? Are you working with seed stock producers? I know absolutely some conversations, you know, a lot of times seed stock producers are going to be more apt to have more breeding groups if mm -hmm. they're breeding in the summer. And sometimes that brings a challenge to rotational grazing. Like right. that's something you see, or what are you kind of seeing on that front as far as, you know, moving those breeding groups around? Well, that's true. And um, it, it makes a bit of more of a challenge to uh, separate those breeding groups. Um, so you might have smaller designated pastures for smaller groups and things like that and, and to keep them separate. And also um, we work with commercial folks as well. And um, it, it's, it, it just kind of depends on the operation and how they can um, uh, value or, you know, how they intermingle those, those animals. So, um, but yeah, high intensive groups and, and such is, is definitely a norm that we deal with. And um, you just simply have to create smaller pastures and smaller paddocks that uh, can be moved differently than them all being commingled, like you said. So are these typically like single strand cross fences? Are you doing multiple strands? Like, you know, when you have cows and calves out there together, like what's working for producers to try and keep everything together? Well, um, cows and calves, uh, you can pretty much maintain an entire system with a single line of electric fencing going across. Now, calves may or may drift across the uh, the line, but they don't they don't drift across for very long. They always come back to mom. Um, so we do see that happening. But you know, if, if it's strategy, if the strategy is that the height of the the wire is at about their uh, about their head level or just about their nose level uh, with them just looking straight ahead. That is typically a, a very effective way to keep them inside the, the space where mama is at. And um, once they learn or have been shocked, um, they will, um, they'll, they'll respect the fence. And, uh, but there's always this, this necessity to get back to where mom is at. So they'll duck under if they get past and come right back to. And again, the, the, the whole idea is to have a great perimeter. So there's no risk of them getting out or in, you know, in a different area. But yeah, we, we typically always see just a single line. Now, sometimes when we're making changes in life or on ranches or on farms, whatever it may be, sometimes it takes a while to see the impact and see if it's worth doing when you've helped different ranchers or cattle producers implement rotational grazing do you feel like they notice the benefit you know after the next year and that next growing season does it take two three four years like what do what can cattle producers kind of mentally prepare for yeah. you know once they kind of see these benefits of rotational grazing well, one thing that we advise folks to do is to go ahead and weigh your animals before you put them on pasture. So you can get a kind of a benchmark of, of the production and the, the effectiveness of your of your rotational grazing. And then because when they come back off, um, you can take another second weight and just kind of compare their average daily gain. Um, some folks will will measure different groups um, in different parts of the, uh, of the farm uh, and different pastures, let's say. And, and understand what that growth is. So there's some experimental, um, well, you can definitely measure what's happening to your animals while they're on pasture and especially after they come back. 
And um, so the ROI, the return on investment is almost immediate because uh, if animals are growing at a higher rate than you would have to have paid to, to, to feed them differently, um, that's huge for us and huge for them um, because gosh, they're, they're, they're taking advantage of the land and you're being a good steward. Um, they're healthy. Uh, they're, they're moved uh, before it's too late. Um, there, it, it just makes complete sense when you start to look at if you've got the property and the ability to rotating, uh, rotational graze, it's just a huge win. So by season number two, let's say you number one, the, the first season, uh, just measuring what your, what your input it is. And then the second season, you can make some different decisions on how maybe you might move them a little, a little tighter. You might move them uh, more often, let's say, um, based on what you've learned. But every 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 situation is a little bit different. But for the most part, you're going to see a return on investment by season two, and um, it's uh, it's wonderful because I, I they're just they're, they're the plant growth is good. If you have a good wet season, um, obviously during drier periods, you really need to move them a lot faster because you don't want it to get trampled and eaten down too far too quickly if there's a less of a density. So. A lot of factors go into um, the, the success of it, but it can be realized very shortly. Now, you said, you know, weigh your animals and have a measurement there. What about, you know, taking a measurement for forage production, you know, and checking that each year, too? Is that something you recommend? Absolutely. 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 See that all the time. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's you need to measure this. You need to measure your effectiveness all the time and making sure. And that's that's the best way to do it is measure the, the animal growth and also our, uh, the plant growth as well as the animal input and conversion that you're that you're seeing um, amongst your team, amongst your animals. Well, great. Ray, is there anything else that you want to add or talk about while we're on this topic of grazing and trying to think spring, trying to maybe, maybe I'm having all these spring episodes to like will it upon us or something, but <laughs> <laughs> is there anything else you really want to talk about? Well, I, I just want to drive it home because rotation grazing is huge and it's an important practice, you know, um, and you just carefully manage your pastures and provide that fresh water and um, uh, the health and productivity of a pasture can be improved. Um, it, it just, it's environmentally right to do this. Um, and animal welfare, welfare is always a, a huge part of this and making sure that they're safe and um, observed and uh, anything that, uh, that you can do to improve their welfare is just absolutely key to, to, their, to their growth and success. So yeah, anytime you can, this is the best thing to do. And it's not expensive to do. It's just a few tools like that that are needed to, to keep them going and uh, get the highest yield from, from their conversion on your pastures. Well, right. And like you just said, you know, it's environmentally right, but from the people I've talked to, it's also economically right. And so when Absolutely. those two combine, <laughs> why wouldn't you do it? Although, you know, it is a change. So, but producers, if you're out there listening, ask for help. Like I always say, because I always say cattle producers are jacks and jills of all trades. Yep. And sometimes we need to do a little bit better job of building up our team and asking for help. I know some cattle producers who have great teams and are great at that, but Sometimes we just need to ask for a little help and guidance, but well, we, we are all students here, you know, we're all students of the, of the industry and um, we love to listen to success stories across the country and um, we build on each other's experiences and uh, together we're, uh, we're, we're building a better, a, a, a better outcome here for, for cattle and conversion and just better use of the land. Well, awesome. Thanks for being on the show today, Ray. As always, it's great to have you on. Thank and, you for uh, having me. Yeah. And we'll link um, any materials, whether that's the tumble wheel, reels, um, all that information. I will make sure to link all of that in the show notes, um, either under the episode description, or if you are someone who likes to read the summaries, it'll be linked there as well. So okay. sounds good. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.